Hi, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so, like she said, I'm Katie. Um, I was really excited about doing this talk because I, I help people with their diets all the time and I like doing group events. Um, so who I am, she's explained, but I have a real passion for gardening and canning and berry picking. Um, funny enough, I'm not actually a vegetarian, but um, I do fishing and butchering, butchering and meat curing, but I eat mostly a plant-based diet. And so this is where I'm coming from with this. So always the first question is, what is a plant-based diet? Um, plant-based foods include vegetables and fruits, um, legumes, nuts and seeds, and grains and starches. Uh, there's a few different definitions of a plant-based diet, so it gets confusing. When I first was starting really looking at this topic, um, I was amazed at how many different definitions there were. But these two I thought were really interesting. So the um, American Dietetic, Dietetic Association from Canada, it's a regimen that encourages whole plant-based foods and discourages meat, dairy products, and eggs, as well as all refined and processed foods. Now the group Forks Over Knives, they have a slightly different take on it, which is a whole food, plant-based diet that's centered on whole unrefined or minimally refined plants. It's a diet based on fruits, vegetables, tubers, whole grains and legumes, and excludes or minimizes meat, dairy products and eggs, as well as highly refined foods like bleached flour, refined sugar, and oil. So that's a mouthful. This is my version right here. This is what I like to think of. Um, I like to focus on eating a diet that's high in vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, seeds, grains, um, high in fiber, minimally processed, and um, just reducing our animal products in our diet if you don't choose to take them out altogether. And I like this little plate. I teach a lot plate method when I counsel patients, and I thought this one was kind of cool. Um, the other thing I wanted to address is the word diet, which I know has kind of got a lot of connotations. Um, my idea of diet, what I'm talking about, is the kinds of foods an individual or community eats. Kind of like an eating pattern or style, something that is sustainable over a long period of time. I'm not focusing on restricted eating, um, kind of like fad diet. Um, I don't like I don't like diets that, or eating patterns that are really unsustainable and you can only do for the short time. To me, that's, um, it's damaging over a period of time. So plant-based eating, there's a whole spectrum to think about, which is um, vegan is the one that most people think of, I think, when they think of plant-based, which is uh, the most, um, there's no animal products at all. So no honey, no animal or insect-based dyes or ingredients. Um, of course, no meat, poultry, eggs, dairy. Emphasizes, again, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, vegetables, and fruits. Um, one big thing if you are vegan is it's really important to get B12 because you can only get B12 from animal sources. Uh, also, uh, a lot of people who are vegan need an iron supplement. Not everyone, but... Um, it's a little bit more challenging to get enough iron in. So vegetarian is a very vaguely defined term. Um, so it includes multiple styles of eating, which is lacto-ovo, pescatarian, flexitarian, or semi-vegetarian. All these different terms, I know. It may or may not include dairy, eggs, fish, insects, sometimes limited amounts of other sources of animal proteins. Um, but again, emphasizes the whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, vegetables, and fruit. You're gonna hear those words over and over again as I'm talking. So lacto-ovo means that you can include a small amount of dairy and eggs in your diet if you choose. No meat, fish, or poultry. Emphasizes the same thing the other ones do. Um, pescatarian, some people include fish. Um, sometimes they include eggs and dairy with that, not always. Again, you're mostly focusing on your whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, vegetables, and fruit. Um, flexitarian, which this is kind of what I consider myself, which is also called a semi-vegetarian, where you're still emphasizing your whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, vegetables, and fruit, but you eat small amounts of animal proteins, whatever, you know, fish, eggs, meat, poultry, 
animal and insect products. Omnivore. That's what's like typical diet. What we think of as just the normal eating pattern is omnivore. So I was trying to find a picture and I was like, I know Thanksgiving dinner reminds me of an omnivore. So think about what you eat. Um, most people eat a daily basis. So I'm really interested in the research behind different diet styles and what's actually most beneficial for people. And so I spent a long time while getting ready for this talk um, over quite a bit of period of time looking at all the different research that's out there to see what actually has some something to say about it. The problem with scientific research on nutrition is that you have to rely on people actually reporting their diets accurately. And um, you can't account for like, how did someone eat when they were growing up? What's their stress factor? What's all these different things? There's too many factors involved. So I tried to narrow down the stuff that actually, um, that was accurate research, not just research trying to just you know, prove a point that someone already had. So this was one I really liked just because it was such a huge study. Um, so Eating Patterns and Health Outcomes was what the title of it was. Um, it looked at all these different diet styles, vegan, vegetarian, semi-vegetarian, pescatarian, and omnivore. They had 1,475 participants, so a big study, and it's hard to find these big studies with diet studies. And they found that um, vegans have the lowest intakes of calories, fat, and protein, and the highest intake of fiber. Vegetarians, all the different forms, had lower calorie or energy intakes than the omnivores. And the omnivores had the lowest intakes of plant protein, seafood protein, vegetables, fruit, nuts, and whole grains. So. And this is just because I'm nerdy and I like this kind of thing, but this is kind of the breakdown of, of what they showed. I thought it was interesting, especially looking at like the fiber and the protein, the fats. Big variation. So this one I find really cool too. I, I work a lot with people with diabetes. And um, there's been a lot of research out there on plant-based diets and its effect on diabetes. And so this is just a comprehensive review of a lot of different studies um, based on it, well, type 2 diabetes. And based on this review of diets, um, of studies, the Canadian Diabetes Association found that plant-based diets improve body weight, glucose control, which is your blood sugars, um, cholesterol, and also may reduce the need for diabetic medications for those with type 2 diabetes. But the coolest part of it is that the benefits can result not just from um, a strict plant-based diet, but just increasing your plant intake and decreasing your animal protein intake. So that's, um, I thought that was a really cool part of the study. And then the barriers they found for people were that, of course, family and social influence. So who's around you? Is anyone else following the same diet? Also, a lot of people really like eating meat. So if you prefer eating meat, then it's hard to go on a full plant-based diet. Um, and then meal planning skills, like how do you even go about doing a plant-based diet? And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, heart disease, there's been so many studies on heart disease and plant-based diets. Um, but these are the ones that I actually found had something um, very valuable to say. So the American Heart Association looked at the deaths in 2015 and found that diets high in unhealthy food choices contributed to 400,000 cardiovascular um, heart disease related deaths in just 2015. And um, minimal intake, so their takeaway was minimal intake of healthy foods and high intake of unhealthy foods contributes to this. It's not a huge surprise, but the numbers were surprising to me. Um, and this next one I thought was kind of cool because um, Iron, I had not realized this before. So there's two forms of iron. I mean, I knew this, but there's two forms of iron. There's your animal, the iron you get from animals, and the iron you get from plants. And the, um, so the absorption of the iron from plant sources, our bodies really know how to use well. It's not as efficient, but it knows how to use it better. Um, the iron sources from meat, we take and uh, absorb more quickly. 
And when iron comes into our body, it increases our oxygen levels. But too much absorbed iron too quickly, too much at a time, can cause some tissue damage due to inflammation. So I hadn't realized that before, but I thought that was kind of interesting. And then um, the other one on heart disease was that there was 45,000 volunteers from Scotland and England, and they just looked at all what they ate, what they reported they ate. And they found that vegetarians had a lower risk of heart disease, 32% lower, accounting for all other factors. Um, age, smoking, alcohol intake, physical activity, education, all that. So I thought that was interesting. I don't know how accurate this one was. This one was the one I was a little hesitant on sharing, but. Um, it's such a large group that I did find that interesting. These were the two I found most important. Um, first of all, just because something's plant-based doesn't make it healthy. So if you're eating a plant-based diet, but you're just eating sweets, refined grains, and highly processed food, it's not going to be beneficial. But if you're including mostly a higher intake of legumes, vegetables, and whole grains, then you have a greater health benefit. And the last one is that it's never too late to improve your diet. No matter how old you are, you can have um, a big impact on your health. Because they found that um, there was a great decrease in the risk of early death from any cause or premature death by increasing your vegetable, fruit, and whole grain intakes. So replacing one daily serving of red meat for one serving of legumes or nuts can contribute to the decrease of premature death. So I thought that was kind of neat because it's a very simple replacement. Okay, now we're going to the part that you actually probably want to hear. But um, how does this actually work in the real world? How do you actually apply this into your life? So protein, so right now, well, I don't know how long it's been going on, a number of years now, there's this big um, kind of in pop culture, there's all these fad diets that are really emphasizing very high protein diets, very low carbohydrate diets. And there's a lot of um, possible health risk factors having to do with it. Um, it's hard on your kidneys over time to eat a high animal protein diet. So most adults need a lot less protein than what they think. And I broke this down because I do these calculations every day. But um, so you see, like, for someone who weighs 120 pounds, their real protein needs are 43 to 65 grams per day, which is very small. And um, if you're 200 pounds, you still don't need as much as probably you've been promoting. Um, so like 72 grams. So I just thought it was interesting. Um, I'm going to talk about where we find plant-based proteins and show you. You can get, if you, need, if you need about 60 grams of protein per day, and you're eating a bunch of legumes, nuts, peas, I mean tofu, oats, even like spinach has protein in it. So if you're including a wide variety of foods in your diet every day, then you can get enough protein just plant-based. I always think like my favorite. I mean, lentils are amazing and beans are amazing. There's so many things you can do with them. They're so high in nutrition. It's a really great um, protein source. You keep changing units. You go from ounces to grams. What is it? Grams. Well, this is protein. We do grams. I don't do ounces for, right. for protein. You, what's it, what is it a gram in comparison to? Um, so when you're eating a, um, you're, <laughs> I don't have it right on me right here. So a gram of protein, when you're looking at your nutrition label, it's going to have it in grams of protein on there. So if you look at any nutrition label, I mean, even this water bottle has its little nutrition, protein zero grams, because there's no protein in grams. Yes? There's 454 grams in a pound, so an ounce is about 30 grams. There you go. I'm not, that's not my strong suit. I can do it on paper, but I can't do it in my head at all. Um, that's a great question. Calcium. So milligrams, we measure calcium milligrams. Often the question is, how do you find enough calcium from plant-based foods? But a lot of plant-based foods have a good amount of 
calcium in them. I was really surprised by blackstrap molasses. A tablespoon, you're gonna use a sweetener, but blackstrap molasses for one tablespoon is 200 milligrams. So adults need like about 1,000, 1,300 a day. So it's not just from dairy products that you get calcium. I really don't mind if you guys interrupt me with questions, it's totally fine. Oh, go back. Yeah. What's that? 94 uh, Oh, 94. Oh, you know what? I messed that up. Sorry. That meant a cup. I don't know. Sorry, I was doing a lot of the last minute editing. It's supposed to be one cup. I apologize. 94 kales. <laughs> right, right, right. Just eat kale all day, you'll get enough calcium. That's a good question. Um, and then iron, like I mentioned iron before, so there's actually a decent amount of iron. So this is the non-heme iron that I was talking about is from plants. And of course, cereals and a lot of breads are fortified, so that's a grape nut cereal. It's fortified, and that's why it's so high in iron. But even other, you know, there's a lot of other foods that are high in iron. Um, I was actually surprised that almonds and pistachios had a lot of iron in them. And the trick with iron and calcium, I can leave that up for another minute if anyone wants to look at it. But. Well, so I don't know what's raw right off hand, but there are some foods that you gain more nutrition if it's cooked rather than raw. So there's some nutrients you gain more from it being cooked than from raw. And I'm not sure if that's true with spinach or not, but kind of like my school of thought is if you eat some of your vegetables raw and some of your vegetables cooked, then you'll probably get it all. Um, so here's the note about iron and calcium. So if you eat vitamin C rich foods, which kale is a vitamin C rich food, kind of funny, but um, if you eat vitamin C rich foods, then it can help increase the absorption of iron and calcium. Though if you're taking a supplement, you should not take iron and calcium together because um, from foods, our body knows how to use it, but supplements, it, they kind of counteract each other. So if you're really low on iron, you should probably, even with foods, you should take you should eat it away from your calcium foods. So only if you're low on it. But on the supplements, I know they sell them off at times ordered together, but they really should be taken separately in that form. Okay, so this was the big part I wanted to talk about actually with all of this, is that I decided this summer to do a project. I grew up in Wyoming in cattle country, and I grew up total meat and potatoes. And my, re <laughs> I, uh, my rebellion as a teenager as I became a vegetarian, but I had no idea about nutrition. I just, I just didn't eat meat. I'd eat french fries, and I was like, but I'm not eating meat. So I then, um, once I moved up here and I had kids, I started um, thinking a little bit more about what I was eating. I wanted to be a little healthier. And so I started eating and including more vegetables into my diet. But then I also started eating meat. And, um, but I started with fish and then wild game and then anything that was locally farm raised um, was more my emphasis. And so I learned how to do a lot of, you know, like whole foods, making it myself and all this. And it was a really fun process. But of course, the irony of when, um, and the, and, the process of all of this, I went back to school and became a dietitian and got a full-time job. And the irony was, as a dietitian with a full-time job, I didn't have time to do as many home-cooked meals like I did. I know, it was really embarrassing. Um, but uh, I, I decided to increase my, my, the plant-based foods in my diet because I wasn't able to make everything homemade in the same way anymore. And when I was asked to give a talk for this, um, this uh, lecture series, I decided I wanted to do it on plant-based diets. And in order for me to really feel, um, I don't know, like it would be fun, as I decided my summer project was I was gonna be a vegetarian for the summer and actually do it right. 
and learn how to be vegetarian again in Fairbanks and eat healthy foods and how, anyway, so this was my summer project that I had a blast with. My family put up with me on it. So this is my daughter Gwen, and um, a number of years ago, she's much older now, but this was our gardens when I was really getting into gardening and um, learning how to um, grow all kinds of different things. She's my main cook in the house besides me, so she was really excited about this project. And she's helped me find a lot of the recipes and different tips and things that we've learned to eat. In fact, she made this dinner. And I was very excited. So vegetarian at home I found really easy. I can make things at home. We can have control over what we do at home. And so this was our, our dinner of spaghetti with mock meatballs. And the meatballs are made with like beans, whole grains, and nuts. And they actually, everyone agreed, including my 13-year-old son, that it was really good. He liked them as much as actual meatballs. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but we were still eating. This was vegetarian, not vegan. So we still had some cheese. and. A salad, so we tried to make everything as healthy as possible, and this was a hit. We make this all the time now. So, vegetarian eating out, I actually found really exciting because when I look at a menu eating out, I hate all the choices. And so, as a vegetarian, I got to eliminate like two thirds of the menu for most places, sometimes three fourths. And um, I liked that idea. Also, it was fun eating around Fairbanks and seeing what kinds of foods you can actually get as a vegetarian. Now, I wasn't being super strict, so I didn't say like no chicken broth because that would take a lot out, that kind of thing. But, um, but I found like, you know, of course, Mexican food, there's a lot of beans, rice, vegetables you can order. Um, Thai food, I think, is the easiest. If you're not, you know, excluding fish sauce, then you can get some really good Thai food without including the meat. Italian, um, of course, anything with eggplant I love, so that was kind of easy. Eggplant mushrooms, um, ordering anything, you know, like antipasto kind of stuff without the meat. Pizza, because, you know, who doesn't love some pizza? Um, I love the fact that with pizza, um, I mean, if you're, you can eat cheese on it or not, but when you order it, you order all the vegetables that you can, that you like. And if you still eat cheese, you just ask for one light layer of cheese. Because you know most restaurants will put on like three or four layers, and it's like mostly cheese and barely anything else. Um, and then I found American style restaurants. They were the most challenging. There's a few in town that have some options, but um, mostly it was like, oh, look, I can order a salad. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is why I used to eat a lot of french fries when I was a teenager in Wyoming at restaurants. Vegetarian at group events. This is also really interesting. So I had a family gathering this summer with my family, and I gave them a heads up that I was doing this vegetarian project this summer. And um, it kind of went well and kind of not on some days. So the first dinner we went to with my family, my oldest brother was in charge of cooking. And he said, hey, I um, made some chili and hot dogs. I didn't know how to take the meat out of the chili, but at least there's some baked potatoes. So that was, <laughs> I was like, well, OK. Well, I can make a baked potato work. Um, I went to some other like Fourth of July picnics and different things, and I found that I just made sure I brought something with me. It's the best way. If you're eating mostly plant-based or you're a vegetarian, just bring something yourself. Um, kind of the idea of make at least half your place vegetables if you're at like some kind of group event, and then add some whole grains and bring something of your own dish. I can imagine if you're vegan, it must be really, really, really hard to make it work. Which I did vegan for only three days, but I did vegan for three days. I found it so challenging. Um, I love a lot of vegan foods, but there is something about not having an egg and I just wanted a lot of salt for some reason. But these are my three favorite dishes that we made. So I'm not usually a porridge fan, but I made one that I really liked with um, lots of nuts and coconut. And um, I did a combination of steel cut oats and farro, and it was really good. And then um, I used to always hate Brussels sprouts until this summer, and I finally learned how to cook them, so I like them. So I used Brussels sprouts with dates, mushrooms, kale, garlic, and spices. It was very, very good. And then um, the thing that really surprised me is I made like mock macaroni and cheese with um, you use nutritional yeast and some spices and um, and then we had some 
baked tomatoes on the side and um, kale with mushrooms. But um, again, my kids really liked this dish, which I thought was really fascinating. The macaroni and cheese I actually really liked. It was fun. It's made out of nutritional yeast. So, yeah, I found, I just found a recipe for it. I use it nutritional yeast all the time anyways. But I th it, was, it was a fun project. You could use cashew cream too. That too. That is fabulous. That's yeah. That's, it. That's what I did actually at the hospital um, in March. We had National Nutrition Month. And so I did a plant-based diet project for that. And we did a served a full vegan meal. Well, not, I mean, little tidbits, but a vegan um, spread for employees at the hospital. So we had like a burrito bar and some butternut squash soup with cashew cream. And oh my gosh. It was the most amazing. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I loved the most is like I, I, I like to think of cooking as like creative art. And so I thought this brought out more creativity. So here is my big thing about how to think about um, being more plant-based, which is, first of all, just increase your vegetable and fruit intake. If you're eating vegetables and fruit at every meal, then adding more produce will reduce your meat intake and help you develop a taste for more plant-based foods. Um, so rethink your plate. This is what I tell all my patients all the time. Oops. Um, is that think of vegetables as like the star of your plate. So when you think about a typical American meal, usually like you have meat in the center and a big carbohydrate and then just a little bit of vegetables on the side. And so I changed it up to think of vegetables as the main part of your meal. Add some whole grains and legumes. And then um, if you want to include animal-based foods, just use them as a way to flavor your, your meal. Like with meat, that's how I eat meat. I use meat as a way to flavor meals, not as the meal. So, um, and then find what plant-based style works for you, like whatever you're comfortable with. So try eating a plant-based meal just once a week. See how it goes, see if you like it, try out some new recipes um, and have fun with it. This is my favorite quote about eating, which is eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I like to keep that in mind, and questions. Ask away. <laughs> yes? Uh, Kate would like to hear about a year or two ago that um, said exactly the opposite of what you just said. Yeah. And so I, I agree with you that a plant-based diet is very desirable. Yes. There's lots of reasons for heart disease and helping prevent cancer and for the planet. Um, so several problems I have. First, yes. a lot of those diets you just showed really didn't have a lot of protein. The lecture I went to a, a year or two ago here is by a professor of nutrition whose field was protein needs for adults, especially older adults. Yes, that is a little different. Older adults do need higher protein. And his contention was that getting the essential amino acids, yes. not just protein, yeah. but getting that at least 20 or 30 grams, most meals, yep. essential amino acids, is almost impossible on a vegetarian diet. That you have to have a 5,000 calorie diet to get that many uh, essential amino acids that if eating the major source of those are going to be meat, eggs, and dairy. Yeah. So I think it is hard. I've, I've been trying to get a plant-based diet, but like start with breakfast. Yes. Eggs, yeah. milk, cereals. It's hard to have a kale breakfast. Um, so it's true. So. My takeaway, again, this is like why I say like my focus is more on eating mostly plant-based because I do think, I do think there is some nutrients in um, animal proteins that are, it's easier to get at the nutrients you need. When I did those, my short little stint of vegan, it was really hard for me to get enough in, like it was, it was a challenge. But um, 
So that's where, like, for breakfast, I have an egg, but I eat a lot of vegetables with that egg, and I have a whole grain tortilla or a piece of toast with it. Nuts? nuts are a great way, too. So that's uh, the porridge I did. Like, it was um, steel-cut oats, farro, a bunch of nuts, you know, some chia seeds, all those things. When you include those... I, I agree, but I have a... I make up a porridge kind of in the morning with yeah. eight grain cereal, yep. dried up almonds and walnuts and pecans and but I, I you put milk on it. So you yeah. and we had the dairy thing. It's hard to have dry use almond milk. It's okay, that's why that's what I'm saying. Like eating mostly those studies I was showing you, the t Yeah. Takeaway of the studies I was showing is that you do not have to, and the latest ones have come out, you do not have to be a strict vegan to get the benefits of a plant-based diet. It's if you're eating mostly plant-based is the important part. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm curious if you uh, looked into the China study. I have. I looked into the China study. I looked into the McDougal. I looked into a lot of those. And some of the questions I have with them, and this is why I chose the studies I did, is some of them compared um, vegan with regular diets, but not vegan versus vegetarian versus. And that's what I was fascinated by, because how much difference is it whether you're going strict plant-based, low-fat, versus a regular diet, or all these different variations? But in that book, they also talk about the links clearly between animal protein and disease, too. So. Yeah. No, I know. And that's, a, that's what I'm saying. A lot of these studies, I actually looked at some of these, and I got really frustrated because a lot of the studies they reference or they're using, I just found um, weren't, weren't as conclusive or had as much of what I was looking for in it. Like, I... I, I can't tell you how long I spent looking at different studies to try to find something that I felt good about talking about. So, no, I looked a lot at this. <laughs> yes? You know, one thing you didn't mention that I think is really a big factor with meat, like 98% 90, of people, meat people eat is commercial meat. Yes. And it is filled with junk. Yeah. Hormones, steroids, antibiotics, Fear hormones, so that's you know that's another thing. Yeah, maybe in some ways it's okay, but add that in and add in this market. Well, I definitely think it's best to eat um, wild game, fish, and you know like um, local farm, you know, locally raised meats, but for a lot of people, it's not always an option, and the cost of it isn't always the option. So I mean, you're right, but yeah, yes. Well, I think cost uh, can be equalized if instead of eating five meat meals a week from, you know, yeah. just commercial meat, and you go to one or two meat meals a day of high quality meat, the cost is the same and you're going to be a lot healthier. Well, this is why I like to emphasize plant-based. People are always like, it's so expensive to eat that way, but really, like, if you're eating, like, to me, um, Things like beans are one of your cheapest foods you can eat. A lot of whole grains are really inexpensive, and like you don't have to eat fresh vegetables all the time. You can get frozen sometimes, especially here in the winter. How often are fresh vegetables at the grocery store actually fresh? How long have they been, you know, taken to be shipped here? So, yeah, you're right. One of your slides quoted 400,000 people a year in the U.S. died with cardiovascular events. You talked about the 30 percent or so less reduction. Mm -hmm. For people who have more reduction for people who yeah. have a plant-based diet, vegetarian diet, it was corrected for exercise, smoking, etc. Was it also corrected for genetics? No, and that's one thing that I find with a lot of these studies, I find it a little frustrating because you can't counter. There's, there's the genetics factor. There's, um, I mean, there's. I don't know. There's so many different factors in there, and it's true. I tried to find the ones that took out the you know, that included the most factors in it, but you can't count for everything. Yeah. Do you have a favorite source of cookbooks or recipe sources? Yes, I do. Um, so my favorite lately is the Minimalist Baker. 
They've got a great website and the recipes are easy. They're vegan, but I always think that if you go with vegan and vegetarian cookbooks and then you can add animal protein if you want, it's easier than trying to figure out how to do vegetarian and vegan uh, from regular cookbooks. So the Minimalist Baker is my favorite one right now. And then... Um, Would you repeat that, please? Minimalist Baker. Yeah. Um, oh. I also like uh, Mark Bittman has How to Cook Everything, and he has a vegetarian version of it. And it's an amazing cookbook. He's got recipes where he'll give you a basic recipe, and then he'll give you like five different variations, which I find um, really nice because I get, I'm not a good recipe follower. I always change my recipes anyways. So I like it if someone gives me the clue on how to do that. Mark Bittman? Yeah. Okay. Just a comment. Um, yeah. There, there was no discussion about the link to um, the healthcare crisis and the sort of hot topic, and I applaud you for not going that fast. But in 2012, in Alaska, we spent $668 million on diabetes oh, I know. for 731,000 people. Yeah. So, when we talk about the expense of a plant-based diet, is it more expensive than a meat-based oh, diet? Oh, I, I, this is what I explain to people every day at work, is that it is cheaper to eat healthy than it is to pay for all your health care. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to suggest ISA, I-S-A does it. 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 Okay. It's fabulous. Awesome. It's fabulous. It's my garden of vegan cooking. Okay. Yes. What was it? Could she repeat that? ISA, ISA does it. ISA does it. Okay. What's your theory about soy and soy? Mm-hmm. About what? Soy products. Totally oh, soy? Yes. I, I, I eat soy. I actually um, think soy is fine. Like if you're eating like insane amounts, maybe that isn't healthy. I know there's some controversy with estrogens and soy and all this, but um, soy eaten, you know, in a, you know, in an appropriate amount, eating a little bit every day or whatever is actually a really great source of protein and calcium. Yeah. But I was I don't know if you would recommend, I don't think you would recommend the isolated soy proteins, you buy that fake. That's, that's why the maximally, yes. Stuff. Well, so I really like minimally processed foods. So anything that's too extracted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Friend out of my family was vegetarian. Mm-hmm. And I remember years ago, we had a very frugal budget. Yes. Um, and what we wanted to do Diet for a small planet, yeah, I know that one. And it was so great because it got to be the point to the point where my kids would say, Mom, what's in this book? Go get that book. Look at that chart. Oh, that means it's yeah. just incredible because each chapter had exactly what was in the food. It just became such a rich topic of conversation. So it is. I actually find there's a lot of books from the 70s and 80s that have a lot of amazing recipes because they really focus more on whole foods. I have a crazy cookbook collection, and those are my favorites. So, yeah. Yes? Um, he, he was referring to uh, the age-related uh, needs of, for increased protein. Yeah. Is there any sources of, uh, for information on what that kind of uh, change over time is? So for, yeah, so the way I do it at work, because um, I, I work both inpatient and outpatient, but how I, I mean, if you go into the DRI, the, um, let's see, let me get down to the dietary reference intakes by the U.S. government, they, they give you a, a whole huge chart on how to, I can put that back up, whole huge chart on how to, um, all your basic needs, like your lower level needs. 
So for some people, um, like with the protein, it's true as you get older. So usually between 60 and 65, you start needing a little bit more protein. It's harder to keep your lean body mass as, as you get older. So having a little bit more protein is important. But it's still, it's kind of the idea of having um, smaller, smaller meals that include protein at every meal. You don't have to have large amounts at a time, but. Yes. But another piece of this is that as we age, our metabolism slows down. Yeah. And so the muscle mass decreases and fat increases. Mm -hmm. So but it's not just diet. Yeah. With exercise, we right. need to reduce the fat and increase muscle mass, which is also then no, you're right. Along those lines, it seems like as I've gotten older, I have an increasing intolerance to salt. Yes. You know, it seems like almost from zero to six yeah. kind of water going. Is that unusual or not? No, I mean, a lot, I, I mean, I don't know your specific thing, but in general, so what happens is um, over time your body your organs don't function as beautifully as they did when they when you're younger, and your kidneys get hard hit a lot. And so kidneys help filter out um, a lot of our minerals. And so especially one of the things I looked at with plant-based diets, um, why like why would they be healthier? Is that um, animal proteins, large amounts, are hard on your kidneys. And so over a lifespan, your kidneys are going to be working harder and harder and harder. And so including more plant-based proteins, um, your, your kidneys can filter that out a lot easier. So that's part of, so kidneys have a lot to do with sodium. So, yeah. Well, I found Michael Collins' book, The Omnivore's Dilemma. Yeah, The Omnivore's Dilemma, yes. Yeah, informative, you know, book about what you eat and how, you know, what you eat with the planet and the way the, the bees are raised. Yes. And it just makes you want to eat very little of it. That's why I like, yeah. yeah, yeah. I do have another question. I don't know where I got this, but somehow in, in eating a lot of grains and things to get your protein, is it true that if you combine a little uh, animal protein with it that you absorb maybe more of those proteins from the totally know the, all the science behind that wouldn't surprise me. I know it used to be said that if you were a vegetarian or vegan, you needed to combine your different grains at one meal in order to get the right, you know, amino acid protein combinations. That school of thought has changed as long as you're eating a variety during a day that you get what you need. But um, that's a good question. Now you're going to make me look that up some more. <laughs> yeah. Apparently in, in Europe, when they have protein listed, they talked about protein quality has to be yeah. talked about, not just protein volume. Yes. And digestibility is a part of, of what we're talking about. Yeah. And it's, so if you're just looking at, oh, this has so many grams of protein, well, there's protein quality and there's protein digestibility, and it's hard to get a, a good, um, feed, read on that when you're just looking at labels. No, I, I agree with you. I mean, that's a complicated topic in the end because the same can be said for calories. A calorie is not a calorie that's listed on here. It's how processed it is. So, I mean, I agree with you on that. Um, we're, we're talking about aging and the process and the things that, that diminish with, with age that your body doesn't produce as much as like the hormones. but. I understand creatine is another thing that this, your body produces, and there's some other, several other things. So, are there places that you can find that kind of information of, of the totality of these things, or the, the list of these things that diminish that your body produces with age, and then you could supplement? That is a good question. I don't have an answer for you off the top of my head. I mean, I have. Um, I don't have an answer for you right off the top of my head right now. Um, the, um, yeah, we just pulled a question in the United States, uh, 
at the same time as I mentioned plants, we have to consider uh, Monsanto, nor Naga, glyphosate. Um, has, has anybody, I know you've done a lot of research for this, has anybody addressed the food reading uh, in the perspective of the changes in our gut fauna, flora, biome? And it seems like if we were more aware of what was happening in our gut, and this is an advancing scientist, when we find out how bad, how bad off we are, and, and perhaps what changes to that. I, I wish I had an answer for you on all that. Like, I, it's why I really, like, if people can eat more local and more organic, that's awesome, but it's not always an option. I just, I don't have a PhD, so I don't have all that information. Like, that would be something that, um, you know, someone who specializes in that would have a better answer for you. I mean, it probably does affect all those things, um, our gut bacteria and our health. I mean, we're finding more and more like, you know, contaminants can cause a lot of problems. You just think about like Flint, Michigan and the iron and the drinking, I mean, not the iron, the, um, the lead in the drinking water and the problems that these different toxins cause for health. So I'm sure there's a bunch of them. I just don't have. My question was less about the, the problem it causes. I know it does because it helps more than most people, mm -hmm. but to use it as an indicator yeah. Uh, that's fun. It has to find out um, what happens when we eat American food, food as opposed to most civilized countries. And, uh, I'm sure. I'm, I, I don't know. I don't have a good answer on that. Someone else had their hands. Yes? There's another book. Um, it's called How Not to Die. How Not to Die. By Michael Krager. Michael Krager. Something like that. And he is, it's a really fascinating book. Um, also, he's pitching a plant based diet. Yeah. Lose the meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of references. Okay. Studies and references in the last four pages. Recently, I've been reading about <coughs> natural foods that we ignore because we consider them weeds. Ah. And have you done much? I, yeah, go for it. I love, I am actually um, a really lazy gardener, and this summer I was too busy to really have a real garden, so I'm a great uh, proponent of edible weeds. And um, just around here, you know, like chickweed, an amazing source of vitamin C. It's really good. Lamb's quarters taste like spinach before it starts flowering. Um, you know, fireweed, if you eat the shoots, it's like asparagus. The leaves are good before it buds out. Flowers are edible. Dandelions. Dandelions, yeah. I mean, there's a, I mean, I actually have a funny story. So I was helping out at my friend's farm and they had an intern and he was a vegetarian and he was really frustrated because he's like, here I'm working at this farm and none of the greens are ready. There's nothing to eat. And we're staying in this greenhouse and the whole floor was covered with chickweed and and I was like, ooh, I have a project. We're going to make a salad out of this. So, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of great nutrients. Um, edible weeds are definitely, like, my, I, my garden, even when I have a regular garden, I don't weed it out right away. I wait for, I eat all those weeds, and once, you know, the plants need me to pull some of those out, I do. But, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. All right. Oh, go for it. Um, I've been working in the last year mostly because my sister went vegan and has been enlightening me about a lot of things. Um, but I like to think of myself as an environmentalist and work with the Office of Sustainability up here and um, learn, started learning a lot about um, how eating a plant-based diet can really help the environment. Yes. Um, but even looking um, at some of your recipes that were up there kind of intimidated me and just like, I just seemed like harder to make and so mm. just what I've been learning on this journey over the last year is the simpler the better and yes. roasting veggies has been key for me just cutting up a pan or two of carrots and potatoes and zucchini and whatever you can yes. pack in tossing some spices on and some olive oil and roasting it and having that in your fridge for the next few days and mm -hmm. the more you have accessible and ready in your fridge the more likely you're going to eat it so the simpler the better and just having some lentils ready or rice and Yes. ready to go and um, throw together a stir fry and 
I just I feel like I've been appreciating um, the simple things and learning about spices more. I, oh, I yeah. didn't know how to use spices. I used salt and pepper, and that's yeah. it. And now it's a I'm big like, difference. Oh, yeah. Ginger and curry powder on yeah. everything. And, yeah. Um, yeah, that's actually what I do at home is I, I, once a week, I make a huge batch of beans, save some for dinner, throw the rest in, you know, what we're going to eat for per meal in the freezer. Same with, like, the whole grains. And um, I use my grill a lot. I do a lot of veggie kebabs, you know. I mean, I actually, the recipes I showed you might seem a little intimidating, but even those vegan meatballs were super easy. You just, like, cook grains, beans, and nuts, mush them together, and bake them. So, I mean... Um, they weren't as intimidating as they seemed. It's just I, I play around, around in my kitchen a lot. So that's, yeah. I've noticed lately too that there are a lot of things you used to only be able to get in cans that now you can get frozen, like yeah. lentils and yeah. um, you know they might be more expensive. I haven't done a, a price comparison, but you can get quinoa, frozen quinoa with kale and garlic and olive oil and um, and just have that in your freezer, but. The other thing I do is if I buy a can of beans and maybe I'm the only one in my family that's going to eat the beans, the black beans with my Mexican food, I'll, I'll stick the rest in a Ziploc bag and flatten it and freeze it yes. and then just break some off when I want some for another meal. Um, and that, that's been really helpful because otherwise I would just stick the beans in the fridge and then when I eat later, <laughs> then it's, and it's later, disgusting you're afraid to open them. <laughs> No, that one well. <laughs> yes. Thank you for all the time you spent gathering information. I appreciate that. Yeah, it, it, you're welcome. I, I love doing presentations, actually. I feel stumbly always at first, but I love doing it anyways. Yeah. I echo uh, this comment also. And are you aware of a group in town that discusses this on a regular basis? I don't know. Um, I do, I mean, I wish. It'd be fun, actually. There's a monthly vegan potluck. Oh, yeah, there's the monthly vegan uh, potluck. I didn't notice that. On, at Go Wild Juicery, they have, if you Facebook them or Google them, um, they post information about that. And you just bring a dish, and it's a giant feast every time from the pictures that I've seen. I haven't been yet, but they do that once a month. And oh, that's cool. It's really cool. And what, it's at the, where is it at? Um, they're on um, Lathrop. Lathrop? Right. Okay. At the, at the, it's a towards the Van Horn end by Jimmy and, So um, just look up vegan potluck yeah. on, on Fairbanks Facebook. Vegan potluck Fairbanks vegan potluck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? There's a Fairbanks Forager Facebook page too. And what is Fairbanks Forager? Uh huh. And, okay. And uh, they just oh. people will take pictures of something and say, What is it? Can I eat oh. it? Or somebody will say, Look what I harvested today. That's exciting. Because that is my real passion is wild harvesting. I love it. You said a little while ago, the purple flowers from fire are Yeah. Really? Yeah. I eat them on my salads all the time. That was one of my, let's see, those purple flowers on that salad there. Johnny Jump Ups, Nasturtiums, Fireweed, yeah. Yeah, Nasturtiums. Yeah, yeah, Fireweed, they're pretty. They make salads prettier. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Something I tried to was the part of the Struggling for recipes or shaking things up. She had something new that she would try. And we, we eventually did this once a week. She would make a double batch. Oh, uh, yeah. Give me half of the recipe. Yeah. And oh, that's week, nice. I would make a double batch and I would give it to her in the recipe. So you can find out if you liked it. Yeah. It was such a good feeling cooking for someone else. Oh, yeah, I agree. It made it so exciting to wonder what we're going to get for dinner. That is such a good <laughs> idea. I really like that idea. So, so, That's a great idea. All right. Well, thank you guys for attending.